Good afternoon and welcome to the 2022 edition of Tom Mendoza Presents. I'm Martin Kremers. I serve as Dean of the Mendoza College of Business. I'm very pleased to introduce our host for today's conversation, Tom Mendoza, former president and vice chairman of the data services company NetApp. Tom first joined NetApp in 1994 and was responsible for sales until becoming president in 2000 and vice chairman in 2009. He retired from NetApp in 2019 and currently is serving on the board of directors of Veronis and Vast Data. He earned a bachelor's degree from Notre Dame and is an alumnus of Stanford's executive business program. Let's go back to the year 2009. In that year, two things happened to both Tom and his guest today, Dan Warmerhoven, who was CEO of NetApp at that time. In 2009, NetApp was voted the number one company in America to work for. Also in 2009, both Tom and Dan were the first duo ever to be selected together for the Morgan Stanley Leadership Award for Global Com Commerce, in their case for how they used information technology to benefit society. Please join me in welcoming our good friend Tom Mendoza, who will introduce his guest today, Dan Warmerhoven. Thank you. Thank you, Great. Thank you. 22 years ago, stood right here when we uh, did the endowment ceremony for Notre Dame. And as part of that, they said, would you select a keynote speaker? And I, it took me no time at all to figure out that that should be Dan Warmanhoven. It's 100% true that without Dan Warmanhoven, there would be no name of Mendoza on that school. Um, so I, Dan, Dan has an amazing professional career. He was started at IBM when IBM was clearly the number one tech company in the world, rose up, was doing great, and then decided to go to Hewlett Packard out in California when they were the premier tech company in Silicon Valley. Rose up, did great. Did a CEO job, which walked into a very difficult situation and uh, fought his way through it, but it led him to NetApp. So just a quick profile of what he did at NetApp. When he joined in 1994, I joined in May, he joined in October. We were a little bitty company. Six years later, we were a billion dollars in sales. We went from 250 million in revenue to one billion in two years. Hyper growth. Third best stock of the 90s. So spectacular. But the, and a, a lot of people, when we were standing here back then, that was the moment, right? 2000. It seemed like that would be the pinnacle, but the pinnacle for us really was the fact that the dot-com bubble happened and the whole thing crashed. Warren Buffett recently said, when the tide goes out, you find out who was swimming naked. <laughs> you know? Well, there were a lot of companies that went under when the dot-com bubble crashed. And NetApp was more threatened or more prone than any other company with the highest PE ratio on the NASDAQ the day that happened. Uh, nine, seven years or nine years later, we voted number one company in America to work for. We voted number one in many, many countries around the world. Our team stuck together. And in 2012, Dan met one of his dreams. We went into the Fortune 500 because of his leadership. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dan Warmenhoven. <laughs> All right. So my intention here is to figure out how this guy got so successful at the beginning and then talk about some lessons learned. So Dan, there's a rumor that at 17 years old, you knew what you wanted to do with your life, which is, I think, pretty odd, right? You wanted to be a CEO, is that correct? Of a tech company. Of a tech company, now who does that? It's very specific. That how does that happen? Well, the tech company part came because I fell in love with computers. Uh, even in high school, I was already programming, you know, well, anybody remember Fortran? Uh, I am that old. Um, but I also uh, admired my dad. I, he was a kind of a mid-level executive in General Foods, and uh, in particular in Bird's Eye Division. And uh, he enjoyed his job, he loved what he did, but he was always frustrated by those boneheads back at corporate. And I just figured, you know, uh, if you're going to do it in a corporate world, do it from the top. <laughs> so so I, it was very simple. So it had to be the CEO of a tech company. So you joined, 
So then your high school was kind of an interesting high school, yeah. right? Yeah, it was a Jesuit high school, uh, all male. I, I wore a coat and tie to class every day. Uh, yeah, it was about uh, 600 kids. Uh, and uh, it was really quite an, uh, an impact on me. Uh, Jesuit schools, I'm sure, Holy Cross schools are, are pretty much the same. Uh, they don't just teach you academics. I mean, it's not just academics and athletics, but there's a big piece of uh, a kind of personal development. And, uh, you know, they, they really try to imprint certain values on you. Uh, and in the Jesuit sense, it's uh, become a man for others. And the emphasis is to give back to society. And, and uh, that's the first time anybody had ever really kind of presented that concept to me. And it really, it really uh, resonated with me. And, and it's kind of stuck with me. I spent a lot of time over the years, not just in the business world, but in the nonprofit world. And uh, we got a foundation. We, run with our children and give money away, and it's all fun. So, <laughs> but yeah, that, 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 had a, that, I think, had more impact on me and how I viewed the world and, and so on than either anything that came before or certainly anything that came after. I mean, Princeton was great. It was, it was a lot of fun. I learned a lot, but uh, in terms of my own personal development, I think it was really at high school. So you chose to go to Princeton over MIT. You accepted the both. Yeah, it broke chose. my grandfather's heart. <laughs> uh, and the main reason you chose Princeton was? Uh, Well-roundedness. So uh, the little background, my grandfather was a refugee, if you will, from uh, Holland. He'd been in the university studying architecture when uh, World War I broke out. It looked like the Germans were gonna invade Holland. He was gonna wear a German uniform and he decided that's not a good idea. So he left and came to the United States. But he always wanted somebody to kind of get to the premier engineering school that was MIT and, and go get their degree there. And I got admitted to MIT. He was so thrilled. He was sure I was going to go. I got admitted to Princeton, decided, no, that's a better, well-rounded education. The School of Engineering is just fine, but I didn't want to be an engineer for my whole life. I didn't want to do engineering. I wanted to be in a tech company. So, uh, you know, I went to Princeton, and I, I, my electives were all kind of in the business domain, you know, accounting economics, you know, psychology, things like that. And, uh, and I just felt as though it would be a better, you know, educational platform to, to go do what I want to do. It's an important point that you rounded yourself out. And you, the way you describe it, I believe, is you did a lot of experiential learning. It yeah. It wasn't just book learning. Yeah, Princeton, uh, as you might imagine, I'm sure it's the same here at Notre Dame, any top-tier university. When you go into the engineering school, the computer science department, there's a lot of uh, basically theoretical work and, uh, you know, architectural science and you know, all the rest of that kind of stuff. But I had the opportunity to work in the computer center at the same time. So not only did I study it from an academic viewpoint, I was hands-on. I was part of the system programming staff and things like that uh, in the computer center. And it was really cool. I mean, it really, uh, it, it was experiential learning to a certain degree, but it really helped you, help you close, you know, take concept into reality and, and see it applied. And it was really, really I thought, a, a great educational pairing of, uh, you know, basically academics and, and uh, on-the-job training. You know, having worked with Dan for 20 years, as he talks, he lives all this stuff. I mean, I can tell how it, it imbued his leadership style. Well, before we leave Princeton, I have to say, uh, Dan and Charmaine, his wife, met at Princeton. In June of next year, they're going to celebrate their 50th wedding anniversary. And uh, <laughs> thank you for coming. Carolyn Wu was the dean of this school when I endowed it. And Carolyn became the CEO of Catholic Relief Worldwide. Charmaine ser served on a board. Few people do more to try and help other people come along with them than those two. So thank you. And I, I, before we get to what happened at NetApp, so you were IBM, Hewlett Packard, two of the premier companies in the world. What did you learn there that helped you when you became CEO at NetApp? The difference in cultures. And uh, IBM and Hewlett Packard are almost polar opposites when it comes to corporate culture. IBM is very hierarchical. All decisions, you know, made at the top, pushed down. It, it almost has a feeling of a, of a branch of the military. I mean, higher-ranking officers and, you know, 
orders coming down and all the rest. Uh, and it was, it was very efficient. I mean, obviously, they were very successful with it, but uh, it created a, a very contentious environment internally and a very political one. Uh, at Hewlett Packard, it was just the opposite. It was very collegial. And uh, everybody would sit around the table, and you know, nobody really had rank. Uh, I mean, everybody knew who John Young was. He was the CEO, but he'd, he'd join a meeting, and he's just one of the, one of the participants, you know? And uh, nobody got hung up on stature, rank, whatever, reporting structure. And everybody just contributed to the discussion and tried to make a decision. The problem with that was it was very difficult to close on anything. You couldn't get the consensus formed necessarily. And uh, IBM had a way of just saying, that's it, we're going to do that. Hewlett Packard could consider it for six months, you know, and never come to a conclusion. Anyway, so uh, I, I saw two different styles, both of which were really quite effective. And, and people loved Hewlett Packard. I look back and that is five of the best years of my career. It was fun, it was engaging, it was a, it, I have a lot of friends from there. But uh, it turned out to be kind of slow moving. So uh, when I went to NetApp, I decided, well, you know, there was only 45 people. It, it, essentially, there was no corporate culture. Because <laughs> 45 people, yeah. that's a small tribe. Um, and so I had the opportunity to essentially have a clean sheet of paper to craft a corporate culture that would kind of be the best of both worlds. Uh, and I think we, we achieved that, you know. Uh, Let's talk about our first conversation. Oh, <laughs> yeah, so that, this is good. I, I, uh, I lobbied hard to become the CEO of NetApp. I found a company in June, July, and they were in the middle of a fundraising. So there's going to be a new CEO hired at the time they closed. And, uh, and the lead investor was a fellow by the name of Don Valentine, probably the most famous venture capitalist in the world. Ever. The founder of Sequoia Capital. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Don led the investor, and I went and lobbied Don to get the job. And I did. Uh, you know, he closed the round, and uh, I got the, I think the round closed September 30th, and I was on board October 17th or something. It took about two and a half weeks to, but in that intervening period, I, uh, I got a chance to meet all of the executive team, the two founders, Dave and James, and uh, three founders, Mike Malcolm, uh, you know, everybody in the, in, in the team except for one. Uh, Tom had been on the road selling, hiring, whatever, and uh, I didn't want it to be, I didn't want him to find out secondhand. And I'm sure he'd heard all the rumors. I mean, he's plugged into. I knew we were hiring someone. I didn't know who. <laughs> anyway, uh, so I, I, I called him at home. And somebody told me he was a football fan. Now, I didn't realize at the time, he doesn't care about football. He cares about Notre Dame football. Yeah, no, that's good but he lived in Dallas. And I said, I, I, I said he, he, we hit it off right away. Uh, he's a little older than I am, but nonetheless. Six been, days, uh, come on. Uh, but he always he, brings that up, too. <laughs> I had to work on it somehow. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so at the time, if you think back to 1994, the Dallas Cowboys were riding pretty high. He was living in Dallas. And I just said, look, my game plan is very simple. You're going to be a Miami Smith. I'm going to hand you the ball until you can't run anymore. And he said, all right. <laughs> Hot dog. Let's go. And I mean, it, it worked out right really well. Let me just say that I always worked for engineers throughout my career. That's kind of what happens in tech world, especially back then. It was the first time I ever had an Dan is an engineer, but as you heard, he's also a more rounded business. It's the first time anybody said that to me where they were just going to back you. And it just made things different for me. I knew I could make decisions and it wasn't going to get overturned by the next meeting. We're moving super fast, right? We were growing like crazy. So it had no so we held a second kickoff. Yeah. We just had one. We held a second one so Dan could. Tell the, tell the company. It's going to be a year of sales. I mean, we're going to go sales. hire salespeople. We're going to, you know, we're going to put the entire engineering organization behind making the sales team successful. You said yeah. there's only two things we're going to hire for, sales and engineering. The rest of you get used to it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going that way. Every, everything else is a support function, right? <laughs> so, I mean, if you've got a really good product and you're really good at presenting it to customers and explaining the value, you can't miss. And, uh, and that's exactly what we focused on. So let's think of it. We went from zero, basically, to a billion. And people go, well, you know, there's got to be some luck involved. I'm sure there is. But there were many, many companies funded during that time to do similar things to us. None of them did that. Most of them didn't do anything. 
What do you think we did right that got us through that, got us into hypergrowth? Yeah, I, I think those two or three things. Uh, the first one was we did, in fact, put together a culture that empowered people to go make things happen on their own, uh, but with some degree of guardrails to make sure they didn't get too far crazy. Uh, and, uh, you know, basically, I remember I hired a, a guy in, in Europe uh, who, who was the head of Germany. He was only 29 at the time. Uh, and we made him a country manager. We told him what we wanted him to do. And he had been at Silicon Graphics, so he kind of knew the, the space and knew the customer community. And he said, so what happens now? I said, you go do it and call if you need help. <laughs> I'm going back home. You know, you're on your own, dude. <laughs> uh, but it was that kind of empowerment. And they, they did great. I mean, we had a great business in, in Germany and so on. Anyway, uh, that was number one, was we built a culture where people felt like they would make a difference and so they could pursue their goals the way they, they thought, thought best. Uh, the second was we had a, a pretty strong sense of corporate values uh, and put customers right on top. Now, I don't know if you know how corporate value statements come together, but typically they put employees on top. If you go read Southwest, I mean, they are very proud of the fact that our employees are more important than our customers. I, I always thought that was backwards. So we decided, hey, customers pay the bill. We're gonna, and, and sure enough, we said, look, if a customer calls and needs help, your job is to go help them. And if it's on your weekend, I'm sorry. You know, but the customer comes first. And people got that and didn't fight it. Uh, but it's very clear what the pecking order was, right? Uh, I think they embraced it. Oh, they loved it. They loved it. And they even stuck, I mean, we had five constituents we put in there. It was customers, shareholders, employees, business partners of all forms, and the community. And, uh, and they, they, it was great. That, that kind of guided the path. That was the second thing. So internal culture, especially around decision making. Second one is a, a kind of a corporate value statement that people really understood. It was really simple. And... Uh, and I, I think the third was a, a desire not to over control it. Inspect, review, make sure things are getting out of line. But in terms of oversight, it was just take a look at, we looked at a business review, everybody hated it. One day a month, we would go through all the results of the prior month across every single function. And it took about, generally about six hours. And it was always the same stuff, but you get to see the P&L, sales performance, engineering, IT, HR, I mean, everything. And, uh, but the idea wasn't to basically direct anything. It was to find out what wasn't on track and figure out what, had, what was broken and had to get fixed. And so that process of just inspection actually, you know, we drove kind of the priority list for the executive team. Uh, and it was very simple. Uh, and, you know, the team... I, I, I made sure everybody who worked for me felt like, look, when you come to my staff meeting or one of these business reviews, I want you to leave your business card at the door. It was kind of the Hewlett Packard style. We're all in it together. Forget what function you run. You know, let, let's figure out how we're going to be successful together. And uh, I think that kind of attitude pervaded throughout the company. You know, when, when Dan first joined, we had an offsite in January of the following year. And when you do an offsite and you come up with the corporate goals, you oftentimes go to revenue, you know, you go to EBITDA, you go to all these things that you measure a business on. I'll never forget we left there with our goal being, we're going to create and build a company we're proud of the rest of our life. A model company, yep. That's how we defined it. So when you promoted, when you hired somebody, so are you proud of that person? The answer is no. Hire somebody you're proud of. Are you going to promote a person? Well, he's very, or she's very efficient. I didn't ask you. I just see, are you, and it, it's such an easy filter, but it's a powerful filter because you're starting to look left and right, and you're proud of everybody. That's how I think we yeah. got to we. Oh, yeah. There's very little me in that company yeah. at that time, for sure. No, that was one of those uh, watershed events, if you will, in the company. When we, as I recall, that, that, I, uh, that offsite took place a couple months after the IPO. We went public on his birthday. He said it was the best birthday gift he ever got. Great gift. I figured Great I gift. couldn't top it, so I haven't given him another one since. Uh, <laughs> but you know, never, November 21st, his birthday was the day we, we were listed for the first time on the NASDAQ. Um, 
But we, uh, in thinking about reflecting on it over the holiday period in particular, I concluded, well, now's the time to build a foundation that was really strong. We were only 100 people at the time, 110. And, uh, you know, the executive team was starting to gel. We still had some issues. Uh, but uh, I, I decided we'd get, all get together with the help of an outside advisor, uh, management development type, and uh, as a facilitator, and try to write down what was really important to us and what we wanted to achieve and how we wanted to do it. And, and uh, I think everybody walked out of that meeting believing we had an enormous opportunity and that if we didn't achieve or fulfill that opportunity, it's on us. I mean, was, we had a great product. It was right time in the marketplace. Everything else was in our favor. And if we screwed it up, we had nobody to blame but ourselves. And I think everybody had that same feeling. So we all left with a conviction we could do it. We even wrote a statement down that our goal was to double every year for five years. Double or die. It doubled revenue. Actually, it doubled earnings, I think, is what we said. And I forgot that we were going to get taxed along the way. Uh, it's really hard to double when Uncle Sam <laughs> takes a chunk. Um, but no, we really focused on the revenue line. And uh, I remember the second year in, uh, you know, we, we went public at about 45 million in revenue, 46, 45, 46. The next year we did 90 something, so we doubled. Next year, uh, 150. Yeah, it was only about 150. And I, it was second year in. So I, we sat around thinking, what did we do wrong? I mean, e externally, people how, thought it was great. We yeah, how did we blow it? You know, and we sat around and we did a lot of soul searching around, you know, uh, looking at where we were investing, what was providing returns, what wasn't, you know, what we should trim, what we should reinvest and redeploy resources to. And we came out of there, I thought, what a really great plan. It didn't take effect right away. It took us a year. We'd finished 150 year. The next year was 250, again, not quite double. But then it went 500 a billion. Uh, but that was one of those second watershed events. I mean, when, when you add the, a, a level of growth that's basically 75%, and you, you sit around and look at, what do we do wrong? Yeah. You know? Uh, and I, I'm glad that the analysts couldn't listen to those conversations. Yeah. Uh, but sure enough, we figured it out, re-engineered some things, got it back on track, and, and doubled and doubled. So we went to, we, we wanted a compound annual growth of 100% per annum, and I think it turned out to be 82% compounded for five years. Not bad. And then... The shit is disaster. <laughs> so we honestly didn't see it coming at all. No one did. It's called a dot-com bubble. 70% of our business was tech or internet. Uh, and we forecasted $1.5 in the next year. We had never missed anything we forecast. And all of a sudden, everything froze. We weren't losing deals, but everyone stopped. No matter what they were looking at in tech, it just froze. And... Uh, we had a, for the first time, we had hired for that 1.5 billion. So we went from, you know, people, people talk about us having a great culture. I always say you find out if you got a friend when you got a problem. Yep. We had a big problem. And we had to take action. We had to do a layoff. Never saw it coming. I think the way we did that layoff got us a lot of credit with a lot of people. Yeah, I think there were two or three things to it. Uh, a lot of companies, had quick knee-jerk reactions of cutting staff, but then they didn't realize we're on a, sleeper a steeper decline than they had forecasts. They do it again, and they do it again. That's demoralizing. I mean, you come to work every day, you don't know if you know, you're know you gonna have the same people working with you, you're gonna have a job. And you know, and uh, I remember I, uh, at the time, Jeff Allen, who was still a very good friend, uh, was the CFO, and he was trying to get me to cut the headcount now. I said, well, we'll freeze it. And anybody who leaves, we're not going to backfill. I, I'm okay with that. But I'm not ready for a cut because we don't know where the bottom is. And if you don't know where the bottom is, you shouldn't take any action. Be premature. That was in February. You could see the downturn in, in place. And a lot of the semiconductor companies are cutting. We finished the fiscal year in April. We still didn't cut. We cut at the end of the first quarter in August, six months after the downturn was visible, because you could kind of see where the bottom was. And uh, at that time, we concluded we had to take out about 10% of the uh, employment. Actually, 12% was the goal. 
And I'll never forget, my VP of HR walked in, Chris Carlton, and showed me an article, I think it was from the Harvard Business Review, that talked about resizing and restructuring. And basically the message in the article was, you don't really have to cut the percentage you think you do, because if you cut two thirds of that, for every two people you, you take out, one is gonna self-select out, because they, they lost faith in the company, they're no longer working with their partners anymore, or whatever. And sure enough, I, I, we concluded, okay, 8% would be good enough. Our goal instead was just get the cash flow break even, I mean, earnings break even, just zero. I could, I could tell the street why zero was good. I mean, we, no earnings, but guess what? We're still growing and doing all kinds of good things. So we laid off 8%. In the next three months, nobody left. <laughs> there was nowhere to go. If you had a job, you kept it, yeah. you know? And I'm thinking, oh man, you know, this is not gonna be good. We're gonna come in negative. And uh, we had done some things earlier on to start opening up the energy sector and a couple other things that started to pay off a little bit. And sure enough, that next quarter, not August, but the subsequent quarter, uh, which ended end of October, as I recall, uh, we broke even. And it's kind of, you know, you can see the upturn starting, right? It was like, you know, the new dawn, right? Uh, and uh, the downturn lasted for a while. We went from a billion to 800 million in revenue the subsequent year, so we're off 20%, and came flying right back. I forget what the following number year was, but, in two more years, three more years, we hit three billion. So, I mean, it was still a pretty damn good growth track. But Shocked the, everybody. Yeah, the mix was a lot different. We started early, you know, our, Tom mentioned it. Uh, we were heavily concentrated in tech and internet. Uh, the tech sector for mostly engineering infrastructure, the semiconductor design, software bills, things like that. In the internet world, the internet was brand new. We became the foundation for America Online's mail and Yahoo Mail, and a few other things. I mean, big deployments, big, brand new greenfield opportunities. It was great. And so we just swept, you know, we swept the engineering side, we swept the internet side. But uh, that is like opium. I mean, you get hooked, you know? <laughs> it's just, and, uh, but we started a couple years earlier, probably about the end of 1999, to pick out some verticals we wanted to go after, manufacturing, banking, finance, uh, energy sector, uh, et cetera and started to bring in a different type of salespeople and kind of marketing folks in the field to figure out how to position our product to sell. Change the product, change, change the, the product, and, uh, and it worked. So about the time the dot-com bubble burst, uh, we were already getting some degree of traction in those other verticals, and that's what kept us alive. And sure enough, within two years, about 30% of our business was tech and internet, and 70% was from those other verticals. We totally flipped the ratio and just a period about three years, which is really hard to do. You know, you said nobody left. I had a guy call me at that period, and he said there's only, he's a top headhunter in Silicon Valley. And he said, there's only two companies I can't get people leave, Apple and you. And I, if building a culture that really is a great culture means that it's good in good times and it's good in tough times. Oh, yeah. and you and I went around the world talking to our employees, and their number one reaction was, what can we do to help? Yep. What can we do to bring it back? I started to talk about that layoff. We had so many meetings on how we're going to treat everyone with respect, how we're going to pay them at the upper end of what they could get, make sure we give them references. It wasn't their fault, right? Our business was retracted. And years later, and I know this happened to you, we've talked yep. about it, people come up to us and say, so thank you. I'll yep. never forget how you treated us. That, I think, and I just want to underscore it. Uh, I think this is one place where companies fail to understand what the value is of, of taking a, a former employee, somebody you're now going to dismiss, providing them with a ton of support, outplacement services, resume writing services, you know, headhunter services, whatever it may be. And uh, it, it, it's not because of them, it's because of the survivors and they see how the people they used to work with are treated and the feedback comes back, you know, uh, and it's differentiated in a very positive way. And that left a big imprint all around the world. Uh, and so we didn't just throw people out the door, you know. You saw the, uh, 
I guess the Twitter layoff, right? Guys carrying boxes out, you know? You uh, read about that today. They got an email. Your, your email got turned off. That's how you found yeah. out today. Right, yeah, and the message we gave him, look, you, you didn't do anything wrong. Your job was important to us, and you did it well, but we, we, we got downsized. We can't afford the number of people we have, and uh, so we had to make some decisions. But it, we tried to depersonalize it in the termination process and over-personalize it in a post-support process. So, you know, this for years we I thought about this, and it wasn't that germane to how the world was running. Everything's been going great, right, in the United States worldwide for... It's not now. This is as close to that period. 2008, we went through it. Yeah, 2008. Financial meltdown yeah. happened too. But this is what's going on now. I think, I had so many CEOs calling me, Dan, saying, I've never managed to do this kind of thing. Yeah. Think about it. The people running companies today have never had a downturn. Never seen a downturn. Most oh. of them. In fact, I gave this speech to the CEO of a company I'm on the board of. Uh, he's in his 50s. He's seen downturns. But he hired a really great he head of. He wasn't CEO. At the time. No, he was a president. But he went in, and uh, but he had, he hired a really great head of, uh, of sales and marketing. The president who's a woman, uh, and he hired a really great uh, head of engineering. But neither one of them had led through a downturn. They had been in organizations, but at much lower levels. They didn't have, and now they're at the top of the heap, and they got to make decisions about resource allocation and rifts and all those other kinds of things. And uh, I told Mark, I said, they don't understand what they're facing. And we just had a board meeting. Both of those people look kind of shaken. And I said, you better spend a lot of time with them. Just show them a lot of love. I mean, you know, be their counselor. How can I help you? You know, I mean, reach out to them. Uh, and don't, don't let them figure it out on their own. Just keep coaching them through it. And, and, and I th but that's the same process. You know, really, I agree with you. Uh, you know, senior leaders in the companies now haven't seen a downturn in the last 14 years. That's a long time, you know? Uh, and you think about people moving into senior level positions, 14 years ago, they were much more junior. They knew what happened, but they didn't know what decisions got made and how. <laughs> so when you think about, if you were there right now, and you know that, that we were in that spot, we hadn't been through, yeah. we went through a boom to a, it comes to my mind, in certain things, what, what is it that's our core business that we believe in that we'll bet on, right? We got rid of things that we're not. Because what happens in a boom, you do everything. <laughs> okay, what really are the two or three things yeah. that's gonna move the business? That's one thing I think is important. What, what comes to your mind? No, I, I think that's it. You gotta figure out, well, it's in a sense it's an ROI analysis. Where am I getting the return? And if I've got something that's not producing return, that's the thing that gets cut, right? So and uh, yet preserve the future. I mean, there's certain things that don't produce return right away because they're a work in progress, right? New products, et cetera. But you really gotta be very careful with a scalpel that uh, you just take off fat and don't, don't trim too much muscle. It's a delicate process. And, uh, you know, uh, my personal view was that one thing we had to protect the capacity on, I, I think it was capacity, was in the sales organizations. I mean, you can't make a comeback if you don't have the salespeople to go, you know. The customers aren't spending money, but that's a time when you have to maintain the dialogue even more. You know, if the sales rep only shows up when he thinks he's got a deal, that's not good. If he's spending the time building relationships and when things come back, guess what? The business flows much more quickly. So Specifically in enterprise sales. Yeah, enterprise sales. Enterprise, that, yeah. You can't break those relationships and come back. Yeah. So, you know, uh, we were very careful about where we paired, what we trimmed, what we cut, but uh, I think we, we made some good decisions along the way. Let me shift gears for a second. So speaking to students now, a lot of that is business-oriented. You're all going to be doing it. But if you're giving advice to students today on a lot of people going through school thinking, I wonder what I should be focused on, what, how do I pick the right career, how do I pick the right industry or company, what kind of thoughts do you have on that? I'll do what you like. <laughs> I mean, I, I remember I said I, I started programming computers when I was 16, and I, I really fell in love with that. So it was cool. Uh, and they were old, creepy machines at that time. Uh, but, you know, if you figure out first, and I hope you're doing that as you pick your course of studies, right? Uh, but pick an industry you like. And then, you know, pick a, 
if you will. There's certain classifications, right? Uh, in the business world, it's business to consumer, B2C, or B2B, business to business. You know, I mean, there's all kinds of other filters you can apply, but what appeals to you, you know? Um, and, and what you're going to enter at a fairly low level in the organization. So what, what do you enjoy doing? I mean, I, I, I enjoyed engineering, you know? Uh, but I, I got to tell you, a lot of folks wouldn't want to do that. They would enjoy marketing or, you know, whatever. Uh, you got to figure out what you, what, and I would pick the entry point based on what you really enjoy. Whatever you enjoy is what's going to excite you, and it's not going to feel like a lot of work, right? It's going to be fun. Yep. And then your own performance is going to shine. And but that, those are two critical things, I think. But you said when you first looked at your career, you just knew you didn't want to be behind the tube all day. You wanted yeah, to I don't want to be out in front, right? Yeah. You got to understand what the job is that you're going into. I've had people say to me, I really want that job. And I say, what is that job? Like, a guy said, I want to be a VP of sales. I say, would you travel more than 50% of the time? No way. Well, that's the job. <laughs> I mean, I, well, how'd you come up with that? Well, it's a VP. Oh, yeah, no, that's great. You should be the VP of sales. Big analysis. <laughs> Yeah. But, you know, from my perspective, just a couple of things. You're at Notre Dame, and I think we're the most open alumni in the world for helping the people who go here. And you want to network as much as you can. Jeremy sitting over here. Jeremy was one of our offensive linemen many years ago. Sorry, Jerry, I didn't mean to say many, you know what I'm saying. But uh, I, met him, I met him 20 years ago at a talk I gave in LA for the Alumni Association. He was in a startup. And he said to me, you know, is there any chance we could have a chat? I gave him my card, I gave him, a, and you know, it turned to regular conversations. That's not a one-off event. And while you're here, you want to network. You, you know, people are very open to you. And that's, that's one of the great things about this institution. I mean, we view it as, you know, if we want to help each other. And that, other people have bigger alumni, they don't necessarily help. They have a lot of smart people. They don't necessarily answer the phone. Uh, I would only say that you want to try and get your asks to be a little specific. Some people are just like, I don't have any idea what I'm doing. What would you do? <laughs> but, you know, if I want to be in, if, like if somebody called me and said, I want to be in financial services, I may not be the guy, but I probably know the guy or the woman, right? Who's in it? Yep. And you've done the same thing. You help yeah. people all the time with networking. Yep. But well, let's, uh, let's move to question and answer. I think that I'm always impressed by the group. And so I'd just like to hear what you guys want us to talk about. We'll have Dan, Dan address it. And we have people walking around, I believe, with microphones. Yeah. While they're doing that, I want to point out there's a half a dozen or eight or so NetApp alumni here. In right the there in the middle. Uh, Help build our company. Thank you very much, guys. We appreciate it. Yeah, you know, people bestow far too much credit on the CEO and the president and the founders. I gotta tell you, we, uh, <laughs> we were lucky. We, we had a team of people working underneath us that made us look good. Um, Thank God. Hi, uh, uh, first let me say thank you uh, for coming. Uh, welcome to Notre Dame. Um, you, you mentioned the idea of uh, depersonalizing it, uh, you know, upon termination, uh, but over-personalizing Right, kind of the, the post-employment. Can you can you talk to kind of what the message is you you give to a, an employee an employee right when you're letting them go? Kind of what from a leader's perspective, what kind of communication goes into that? Uh, the 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 first message is you didn't do anything wrong. I mean, we can't afford you anymore, but it's not because of you. It's because of the business conditions. Uh, and that's part of what I meant by depersonalizing it, or, or, or you know, trying to make sure that uh, they didn't feel responsible. Uh, the second point of that, though, was to help them, and I mean really help them. We provided facilities, staff, etc., uh, personal computing. You know, we gave them the PC, for instance, right? The, take all the company information off it, now it's yours, now you can use it to do your resumes. So we, we, we try to give them lots of individual support for whatever they needed. And, um, you know, and, and uh, we, we had a, a, a set of placement advisors to work with them to help them figure out, you know, what the next career move would be. And uh, those are all very personal kinds of things. 
Um, you know, so you try to make sure that they don't leave feeling like, well, I just got cut. <laughs> you you get, try to provide some business context for it, and that's what I meant by, you know, depersonalizing it, make sure they don't feel guilty. And then the, the flip side of that, as soon as they, they walk out the door, we actually had them walk to conference rooms where they could start the process of resume building and all the rest and use that facility you know, for 30 days or 60 days or whatever. And with the help of people who could help. Yeah, real professionals, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, it, it, uh, th that, that sent a message to everybody that uh, we were trying to provide a soft landing. <coughs> you know? Thank you both, uh, very inspiring. Uh, one is more of a comment and then I have a question. And the comment is really to the students and the impact that you can make on, on anyone's life uh, as you're in your future employment. You don't have to be the CEO to be a leader, but any role is a leader and a mentor to others. I'm gonna give you an example. I was in New York City in 2001 on September 11th, and we all know what happened on that date. And I didn't know who to reach out to, so I reached out to Dan Warmanhoven, the CEO. And I left him a message and it was, uh, or Dan and I spoke actually, and I was like, Dan, we had a horrible event happen here in the city. Our customers are not gonna have the wherewithal, the ability to issue purchase orders or do what they have to. And they're gonna judge us 10 years from now on how we react to the situation. And Dan left a message to Mark Bluth and others. And the message was, if Joe Santa Marina says ship it, just ship it. He ran the, manufacturing, Mark Bluth. Yeah, yeah they, they, they shipped about $13 million on double tandem driver trucks across the country. We put them in a garage at Bart Richards house and we delivered that to the financial services industry. So Dan, your impact on, on, the, on many others across the organization, but on me was incredibly inspiring. And it's nothing about money. It's about people who have your back. I think Tom said this before, we're willing to knock walls down. And you don't have to be the CEO to have that impact on people. So that's just a message to the students. The question I have is NetApp went from you know, 47 people to greater than 10,000 people. And you talked about culture. How does a company keep that culture through that tremendous growth that you've had? Because we've seen companies that have a culture and they tend to lose it. So the, I'd be interested in your perspective on that. Yeah, uh, that's a great question, Joe. Uh, can I embellish your comment about the financial services? Uh, one of the big customers who took a risk on us and I say risk because they were one of the first adopters was Lehman Brothers. Lehman Brothers data center was in one of those towers. If you recall, everybody agreed markets are staying closed for the remainder of that week. I think it happened on a Tuesday, but we're gonna be back up and running on Monday. Lehman Brothers was back up and running on Monday on NetApp infrastructure. It was really hard to put it together though. I mean, <laughs> the, the, the amount of, man hours that the guys in New York and New Jersey spent just trying to restore configurations and salvage anything that was there. And they put it into the ballroom of a Sheridan hotel, as I recall, and turned it into a data center. But Lehman Brothers was up on Monday. They opened for business. And I, I tell you, I, I got a personal call from the CEO thanking us as a company for what we did. Pentagon too. Oh well, yeah, yeah, we, uh, yeah. Where the, they, where the plane uh, hit was the data center. Yeah. Our equipment was in that data center. The only equipment that failed over correctly was ours. And they could, they could still keep messaging throughout that tragedy. And they, they called us into the Pentagon for that. You find out if you got a friend when you got a problem. People stand up, your relationship changes, and people who don't, changes again, right? So I think that's a big part of the culture, right? We're gonna it stand was. up for the customer. Customer. Uh, the answer to the other question, it was always a challenge. Um, you know, it, culture is all about behavior, how people act, interact, uh, you know, what they, what they value, like to, are customers really important, right? Things like that. But it's, it's about behaviors. And um, the, uh, the, the challenges, and you said it, when you, I, I, I think I was, you know, the 45th person on the payroll when I started, right? We got it. I think by the time I left, it was eight thousand. But as you scale through that, you know, you're adding zeros, right? How do you how do you maintain the culture? And uh, we spent a lot of time and energy on it. The first thing is you recognize 
what worked when you're 45 doesn't work when you're 450. I mean, you, you need different methods of communication. Uh, they have to be broader. They have to be global. I mean, we had operations around the globe, pretty much. Um, and, uh, and you really got to hire for culture. So a lot of the interviewing process wasn't just about skills and capability. It was subtle. It was softer. It was, uh, you know, tell me about when you were at your personal best. And if a person comes back and, and focuses on themselves, then you know that's probably not going to work. But if they say, I was part of a team, and we did this great thing together, you know, and everybody was successful, that, that, that's what we're looking for. So, but it's a lot of, uh, you know, learning uh, skills to figure out who to come in. And then the other thing was, uh, and I, I really, I'm not sure how to describe this. We had a huge immunorejection system in the company. If we hired somebody that didn't fit in, we didn't have to do anything. They got ostracized. I mean, people stopped talking to them. They stopped inviting them to meetings. They stopped copying them on emails. And they essentially starved them to death until the person couldn't be. Is that not true? I mean, I see them, then that guy's laughing. But, you know, most of the, the people that came in that didn't fit left within a year. And what, what, when you say didn't fit, what comes to your mind? What behavior? Uh, too autocratic, too uh, vertical, you know, too political, you know. Uh, too focused uh, on Yeah, himself. I remember we hired a, a regional director down in L.A. and he, remember the parking lot? Yeah, he put his name on a parking lot sign. That, that wasn't that app. I mean, <laughs> that wasn't know, a good move. He, he didn't last very long. That was a faux pas. Uh, yeah. And I remember going wait, wait. We hired a guy in Japan who built a glass office for himself. In Japan. And he, he took a hammer to it. <laughs> and then he walked boom. I told him to get it out of there. And, and a couple of days later, I'm in the office. He says, I, I can't get anybody to do it. I said, give me a hammer. You know? Uh, we didn't have offices. We had cubicles. Yeah, we had that cubes. Was I was in a cube. Everybody was in a cube. You know? Uh, conference rooms had doors. They could be quiet. But the offices were pretty much open. Nothing, think, nothing went to the ceiling. I think the, the behavior is also that we just didn't want was when people focus on what's in it for them, not the company, not the group. I mean, we, we, we fought much larger competitors. They were all huge companies. I mean, five, ten times our size all the way through. And the only way you beat companies like that is you're more together than them. You're willing to sacrifice more than they are. You're willing to do more than they'll do for their customer. And if it's about... I'll do what's in it for me. You can't build a team like that. So I, I, yeah. I have examples in my mind of people came in and it was clear that they were not team players. Yeah, I, that's, that was a big piece of it. And you can see it uh, every once in a while. Uh, the, the thing I, I think really made us successful is the engineering team really understood that their number one priority is focusing on customers. And uh, I mean, that, that's rare in a tech company. You know, customer support's supposed to fix the customer problem. Well, guess what? Customer support didn't create the problem. You did. <laughs> you know? And uh, you're probably the only one that's going to be able to fix it. And sure enough, the, the, the engineers reacted really well that way. And, uh, but yeah, so it wasn't, you know, my job is to do this. It's much broader. Uh, the fact that you're an engineer is more of an appellation than it is a job description. Any other questions? Oh, I think we have one up here after that. Um, yeah, yeah, echo the things that everyone else gave. I guess it, it's pretty obvious from anyone that would observe here, and I'm sure people that know you, that you two developed a pretty strong relationship, and I'm sure it's similar with others on your leadership team. As you had all that tremendous growth and change and the environment changing around you, what did you all do as a leadership team to make sure that you were moving in the same direction together? You know, we did a lot of reflection uh, and offsites on our internal operations and processes and, you know, how are we functioning? There, there was actually, at one point, it was referred to as a gang of four. There was two key founders, Dave Hitz and James Lau, and Tom and myself, we go to dinner about once a month and, and just and talk we about... we committed to it. Yeah. We were traveling like crazy, but uh, yeah, no, no agenda. Well, let's talk about what's going on and how we're doing and, and what seems to be working, what's not. Uh, I felt as though I had to change my own style at least three times. I mean, just to scale and, and you know, delegate more. Uh, and uh, I had a coach. 
uh, you know, told me to shut my mouth in meetings. Uh, well, you know, it, it's true. Uh, you laugh, but uh, people are looking at what the CEO says and does. And even when you ask a question, they're trying to interpret, why did he ask that question? What's, what's behind that question? So you learn that you just got to sit there and listen. And, and then you can, you can, you know, say something when the conclusions are pretty clear. But it was things like that. I mean, personal style, operational style as a team, uh, different methods of uh, organizational structure, um, you know. And so it was a mix of things. I mean, it was, but it was constant, you know, reflection it started with. And uh, in fact, I, uh, I remember sometimes leaving those dinners when, you know, the three of them would gang up on me. You got to do this. <laughs> Okay. I tell you, put your sunglasses on. He's like, I'm not with you guys. Yeah. He used to, he would take the opposite point of what he actually believed and argue it in a meeting. Now that throws you off. If you're trying to follow the CEO, all of a sudden you realize he yeah. doesn't. I, I was in speech and debate when I was in high school, and I was pretty good at it. But in, in the debate world, in high school, it was competitive. But you have to know how to argue both sides of the questions, the pro and the con. And I got really good at, I thought, arguing without conviction, meaning people thought I was serious, but they never knew what I personally believed. But that helped the debate because now you don't, you know, you're not debating to get on this side. What the other answer I would give you is we had a very personal style of leadership. Everybody yeah. knew Dan, they knew Tom, they knew Rob sitting there, and we were out with the teams. We weren't like command control at all. You know, we both traveled all over the world all the time. We always held meetings with our own employees. Yeah. We'd have dinners with our own employees besides going to see customers. And I think we were very aware of how everybody felt. Well, you had to be approachable, too. I mean, that was a, a key piece. I remember, uh, I learned a lot from my dad. Uh, but one of the things I, I asked him specifically, so he was a regional manager for fresh produce packaging, bird's eye, right, frozen foods, mostly vegetables. And... Uh, you know, he, he would walk the plant, and everybody would know him. But his name was Pete. It wasn't Mr. Warmenhoven. It was Pete. And I asked him why. In fact, this little sign on his door just said Pete. And I said, why? I mean, why not, you know, Pete Warmenhoven? Or, I mean, everybody else had their last name. And he says, I have enough stature that I don't need to broadcast it. What I really need to do is discount it to the point where people are not put off by it and make it easy for them to treat me as just one of their peers. And I thought that was very brilliant. And, uh, and so I've always been Dan. Everybody in the world knows me as Dan. My email at NetApp was dan at netapp.com. <laughs> and, uh, you know, everybody knew how to reach me. And sure enough, you're welcome to. And it really worked. And people felt comfortable approaching the CEO, like Joey just said. And it didn't make any difference what your job was. You were allowed to directly connect to the CEO and ask a question and make a request, whatever it was. And uh, yep. it, set a, it set a tone, though, for the middle management that they couldn't get too elitist either because <laughs> they were going to get killed. Uh, you know, you can't have your own parking spot. You can't have your own title. You can't, you know. And uh, so it, it, it spread. I mean, the toe at the top in that case did spread. Mark, you had a... Yeah, thank you. My question is about your thoughts on flexible work policy, including working from home. Also in the context of building a strong culture, which you have been talking mm. so much about already. Yeah. yeah, that's an interesting uh, situation I think we find ourselves in now as the pandemic, pand pandemic has ended pretty much. Uh, do you return to work or not return to work? And what are employees' expectations now that they've had a different experience along the way? You know, I grew up, you expected to go in the office. I mean, there was no work from home. Unless you're a traveling salesman going door to door, you were in the office. Uh, and that's all different now. I mean, it's all changed. Uh, and I, I think uh, there's some mixed um, outcomes as a result. I was uh, surprised a couple of companies I'm on the board of actually saw when the pandemic hit and they closed the offices, engineering productivity went up. Nobody expected that. Uh, it turns out 
people are less distracted. I mean, they could get their job done. They do it all online. Uh, fewer meetings, you know. Um, engineering productivity actually went up. Uh, I think on the flip side of that, it's harder to build or maintain a corporate culture. There's less meetings, there's less interaction, there's less, you know, everything. And that's a lot of how the culture is demonstrated. Remember I said it's your behavior. It's not what code you write or what PO you get. But um, I, I think that's a challenge, especially as you start hiring again. And, and you know, the, the great resignation drove this home. You know, uh, companies, at least in the tech world, had 20% attrition rates. People stayed at the company, but didn't necessarily want to be there until the pandemic broke, and then boom, now I'll all go look for jobs. Uh, but that means you had 20% of the population to replace. And how do you onboard those people and make them feel like they're part of the company if they're working from home? And, uh, you know, and some, some folks like Jamie Dimon, right, uh, J.P. Morgan, CEO, said, back in the office. Everybody's back in the office. He didn't get everybody back in the office. He had to back off on that one because he didn't want that number of resignations. But uh, I understand why he was driven to it. You really can't collaborate very well unless you are spending time together, whether it be at lunch or, or you know, informal time. And, and uh, it's, just, it's a real challenge. And onboarding new employees, I think, is the hardest one and propagating the culture into the, into the people who are new. Uh, I always thought that people coming into a company, you have to think of as foreigners. They don't, I mean, they, they don't act like you. They don't even speak the same language sometimes. They may have the same skills, but they've been exhibited in different ways and they come from different companies. And uh, how do you integrate them? Well, they, they, they absorb it by interaction. That doesn't happen if you're working from home. So I, you know, I don't think we're ever gonna get back to everybody in the office. And I think in, in terms of sales, field personnel in particular, that, those days are over. Uh, one of the companies on the board of is actually closing a lot of sales offices. Just keep working from home. You know, we'll get you a rent out office someplace to bring a customer for a presentation if you want, but we don't need to have full-time permanent offices. So there's gonna be a lot of changes, and uh, you know, the, I think the real estate sector is gonna get killed here pretty soon. Uh, they're still getting paid for what are now referred to as see-through buildings, empty buildings that aren't being used. Uh, Those are long leases. Yeah, long leases that they're all gonna come due at some point. You know, yeah. you know I, I think it has a lot to do with what you do in a company. So as Dan said, it used to be everybody had the same rule. I don't think that's coming back. Yeah. But I do think there are areas where you need to collaborate and it's a mistake not to come together. I've, I, it, sometimes you get used to something, doesn't mean it's, it's good. My, my wife, Ty, was a lawyer, partner in a law firm. And we, we were at a wedding and her nephew was saying that, it's great, I only go to work once a week as a lawyer, young lawyer, and she said, you know, I got mentored the entire time those first few years by working very closely with super smart people and it accelerated my career. She said, I can't imagine, they wouldn't even know who I was. So I think when you're thinking of your career also, you wanna think about people don't see you and they're only gonna see you on a screen. The odds of you being recognized young are not high. Yeah. And if your goal is to get more responsibility, not for a title, because you want something meaty to work on. You know, it goes back to what are you gonna to look to do? I would get with companies that give you something that you really like doing, but it's substantial. And what companies give people at a fairly young age a shot? Some companies just won't. I and mean, if you get in there, then I think you wanna think of your own time in a way of what, two or three years from now, how do I want people to think of me? And what would I have to do to make that happen? And being behind a screen at home, if you're doing code, that could work. If I'm coding, they, and I turn in great code, right? Yeah. But if I have a job where I'm looking to lead people, I'm trying to show them I can lead a group. You know, you, and if the other people choose to stay home and you don't, and you come in, there's a chance to accelerate your career, potentially. That's how I would think about it. But you know, Zoom and all the great you know, teams, whatever, but they always have a tendency to be fact-based. We're gonna talk about this topic, we're gonna to talk about, you know, but they're not personal. I can't imagine how a manager gives feedback to an employee over Zoom. 
It just, it just it boggles my mind. And, uh, and it, it, it's, not, it's not informal either, and it's not regular. It's always scheduled. We're going to talk about this topic today. Can you imagine if you got a notice from your boss, I want to talk to you about your performance next Tuesday at Zoom at 10 a.m.? <laughs> Yeah, it's not a good feeling. Not a good feeling. <laughs> you know, it's just hard to do. Trey's got a, a question back here. Are you, you, we're done? Last question. Last question. Make it a going, Trey. Yeah. Uh, once again, thanks, guys. It's great to see you guys on stage together again. Um, the one thing I wanted to ask, and I think it might benefit the students, because, Tom, you just touched on it, something that's really been very important to me, and I know a lot of the folks that are here from NetApp is, is you know, your, your own personal brand. And what I'd like to know from you, the two of you is, what do you look for in people coming out of college, getting their first career, their second job, third job? Like, what, what are the, some of the characteristics you're looking for those people that you're trying to pull up in the organization so that maybe people uh, at a younger age could benefit from, from your thoughts? Great question. Yeah, I mean, you can, yeah, there's obvious ones, right? Qualifications, intellect, et cetera. But uh, for me, it's more around personality and personality type, uh, ability to interact with people well. And, uh, you know, um, and somebody who's concerned about others. I mean, if they're very self-centered, that, that it's not going to go very far in any, any business environment. I don't care whether it's a company or a partnership or whatever. Uh, you know, I, I can't imagine why anybody would get into politics because that's all about me, you know. And I just can't, I, I, I want people who don't want that. <laughs> but you know, I, you look for those kinds of traits and scalability and flexibility. And the fact that you're trained as an engineer doesn't mean you're going to be an engineer the rest of your life. So, what, you know, scalability, uh, things of that nature. And, and it really is uh, only ascertained, I think, in an interview process where you're going to ask probing questions. And, and you look for somebody who's really well-rounded. Uh, you know, I remember when I was interviewed for the NetApp job, I'd already been a CEO. I'd already had a pretty good track record. The, Valentine asked him, what sports did you play? He didn't care. What he really cared about is, was it a team sport or an individual sport? <laughs> and all the games around the game were team sports. Okay, that's good. You know, because it teaches you a different type of interaction with people. And uh, so you go probing and you know, look for that kind of stuff. But yeah, I think most of the people we, we tried to hire were all team players, like Tom said, and had some experience doing that in either athletic or whatever activities. Um, you, know, you, you said about the interview stuff. I, I always ask people, what's your biggest failure and why did it happen? And all I want to know is if they say I, I did something wrong, <laughs> what everybody else screwed up. Yeah. You know, my boss is, a, you know. So I'm looking at the NetApp folks who are here, there's seven of them. Every single one of them came in uh, at the first level, Rob ended up running all worldwide sales. You ran all worldwide yeah, that, that sales. Guy in the, in None the blue, of these people. He was uh, probably the first sales rep we hired. He was on board was before either sales, Tom right? or me and uh, wound up going all the way through the company to running, basically replacing Tom, being the president, running all sales. But the, every single one of them, the common thread, and all of them ended up with monster jobs in the company. Uh, every single one of them was never about them. When they came to talk to me about something, it was about something their employees needed. It was never about what's in it for me, how do I get a title. We offered those things because of performance. People who focus on what's in it for them are not particularly impressive to me. I know we, we have to wrap up. Don Valentine was, uh, is the most famous venture capitalist ever. And he said to me one day, he liked me because we were making the sales goals. That's kind of how it works, right? We thought. But he said to me, the two CEOs, by the way, I asked Dan for the lessons of Don Valentine. I'm going to put it out on LinkedIn. He sent me one of those brilliant write-ups. Don, Don's hired more great CEOs than anybody ever out in Silicon Valley. He said, the two CEOs I'm proudest of hiring in my career, John Morgridge, who was the first CEO of Cisco, who happened to be my boss prior to that, and Dan. So, uh, I mean, what you've done for so many, we're all here to say it, means so much. So thank, well, thank you. you. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>
Uh, I'm not sure what form it's going to take, but there is, in fact, a two-page write-up that I put together on lessons learned from Don Valentine. And uh, they're pretty short and sweet. You know, I mean, they fit on a small page. They're worth reading. Uh, Maybe you could post them on the Notre Dame site. Yeah. It's worth reading. So he's got, he's got the Word document or whatever. So <laughs> take it away. Yeah, all that rests me to... All that rests me to do. Here, thank you. Can I help? All that rests me to do <laughs> is uh, to thank all of you for coming and especially thank our two uh, honored guests um, for your fantastic conversation. I have uh, some small gifts as a token of our appreciation. Ah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Wow, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's get it. Bye, let's get it. Come on in. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you all.